Hi, I would like to welcome Dr. Dinesh Pashankar from Yale University. We know constipation is quite troublesome. Think about a refractory constipation and uh, the trouble it would give to us. Dr. Dinesh Pashankar is going to explain to us on refractory constipation the way forward. He is professor of pediatrics and the director for pediatric IBD program uh, at Yale University, USA. Over to you, Dr. Dinesh. I'm going to talk about the refractory constipation, the way forward. Objectives of my talk are to discuss standard management approach to constipation. And I do want to discuss and, some, and spend some time on this because many times uh, refractory constipation happens when the standard management approach is not prescribed or not followed. And then we will discuss causes and work up for refractory constipation and also look at various therapeutic options for refractory constipation. Constipation is a common problem in India, in the United States and all over the world. The prevalence varies from 0.7 to 29% depending on the age of children, uh, where the studies were done and what the definition of constipation was used. But in many of these uh, epidemiological studies, it's clear that constipation is a chronic problem and may last for a few months to years. In 95% of times, the constipation is functional and only 5% of times it's organic due to organic causes. Here's a standard management approach that was recommended by North American and European Society of Pediatric Gastroenterology and also endorsed by Indian Society of Pediatric Gastroenterology. That involves these steps such as education for parents, disimpaction, long-term maintenance therapy with diet and laxatives, and behavioral modification for incontinence followed by close follow-up. I'll just spend a little time briefly on this. So first one, I cannot overstate the importance of education in the first visit. We do spend some extra time in the first visit when child comes with constipation to educate the parents because we want them to be our partner in this treatment plan of this chronic long-term problem. We usually see two types of pathophysiology. In younger children, it's constipation and withholding. What happens is the hard stools cause pain pain causes withholding and withholding leads to hard stools again. And we explain this vicious cycle with the help of diagram. And that makes parents understand that why it is so important to keep stools soft for prolonged period of time so that child gets better. In older children, uh, constipation with fecal incontinence is something that we explain to them in detail with the help of a diagram. Chronic fecal retention leads to mega rectum and mega colon and causes overflow fecal incontinence. Once parents understand this, they're more liable to be very cooperative and compliant with the treatment plan. We also stress long-term uh, nature of this problem and long-term therapy and outcomes so that parents have uh, proper expectations. This does take time, but it's definitely worthwhile down the road to get a more successful outcome. If there's a fecal impaction, this impaction should be done. It can be done orally, which is non-invasive, but takes longer time, or rectally, which is invasive, but yields faster results. Studies show that oral polythene glycol probably is the best way to do disimpaction. We have used high doses of polythene glycol for disimpaction, and also for bowel preparation for colonoscopy in children with very successful results. Lactulose is a second choice of medication. And studies do show that polythene glycol is better than enemas because it is tolerated better. And also polythene glycol can cleanse the whole colon while enemas can cleanse only the rectosigmoid or the distal colon. 
In long-term maintenance therapy, there are certain principles we should remember while using laxatives. Uh, most studies show that polythene glycol is a first line of, should be the first line of therapy. We studied polythene glycol first time almost 20 years back and showed that it was safe and effective. Since then, there has been been number of studies from all over the world showing the superiority of polythene glycol compared with other medications. Lactulose should be the second choice if polythene glycol is not available. It's very important to stress that adequate dose should be used with adjustments if necessary. We tell parents that this is not like using antibiotics for infection where parents should follow the exact same dose but we allow parents to adjust the dose if necessary. For example, if child has infection, goes on antibiotic, has diarrhea, they can cut down the dose, but they should not stop it. In most kids, long-term therapy is required at least for a few months and weaning should be done very slowly when child is better. It's important to be aware that relapses are not uncommon uh, for both us and for the parents to know. Dietary therapy is also important. Intake of fiber, fruits, veg is very helpful and important to avoid excess milk intake. For fecal incontinence, behavioral modification is very important. In fact, probably more important than using laxatives. This involves regular toilet sitting on daily basis, perhaps three times a day, along with positive reinforcement and reward method. And this definitely needs to be done for long term. Close follow-up. Usually we recommend first follow-up in a couple of weeks after the first visit. And then after every few weeks to ensure that parents are following the plan uh, for the successful outcome. So when we do use very standard management approach and the compliance is high, the outcomes are good. Uh, first was our long-term, first long-term study of polythene glycol that we used for nine months. And in, that, in our study, the successful outcome of 93% in children who only had constipation problem. For other groups, children with constipation with incontinence, the success rate was 50%. And that is not unexpected for nine month duration because incontinence results do take long time. In another large series from India, successful outcome over 15 months was 95%. So when we do use standard management approach with good compliance, the success rates are very satisfactory. But what happens in real long term? Here was a very elegant study done in Netherlands by Dr. Bongers and Dr. Beniga. They followed almost 400 kids over 15 years. Uh, that, uh, that, uh, the two conclusions of the, that study is almost 40% of patients experience at least one relapse in first five years. This is a center of excellence for childhood constipation and they're very aggressive about treating their children with proper treatment and ensuring compliance. But despite that relapses do happen. And they also noted that almost 20% children were asymptomatic at 10 years of follow-up. So this study tells us two things. One is despite very well planned treatment relapses do happen. And second is it uh, most of these children do require long-term therapy for many years. Now coming to refractory constipation, the definition is that it's a constipation which is not responding to standard management approach for two months or so. But in our practice, we get a lot of referral for refractory constipation from pediatricians and we find that most likely refractory constipation happens when standard management is not prescribed or not followed. So when we dig into these children with coming as advertised as refractory constipation, we find that the family was not counseled. As I said, I cannot overstate the importance of education and getting parents and family on our side to ensure the treatment plan for this chronic problem. In some cases, disimpaction was not done when needed and directly maintenance treatment was started and that reduces the chances of successful outcome. 
In some cases, diet was not addressed and child continues to have diet, which is causing constipation and therefore does not respond despite using adequate dose of laxatives. Perhaps the most common cause we see is inadequate dose of laxatives. Parents start with the medicine uh, and give very small doses. And if it does not work after two weeks, they and their primary doctor sometimes declare that this medication is not working and this is a refractory constipation. Uh, sometimes the laxatives are stopped too early. Parents feel that after two to four weeks, the child is doing well and they abruptly stop the medication and the constipation recurs. And finally, non-adherence to behavioral modification. Particularly, as I mentioned, behavioral modification is really a long-term uh, problem and therefore needs long-term daily therapy for a few months to few years. So whenever these uh, kids come and when we take good history and examination, we realize that these are the factors causing refractory constipation. And when we address this, like education, disimpaction, diet, and particularly proper management of laxatives and therapy, usually kids get better. And then it's really not refractory constipation by strict definition. What happens with true refractory constipation? If that is the case, then usually we suspect organic causes uh, and that we should suspect when there are some turn red flag symptoms. One of them is not responding to standard therapy with good compliance. So you believe that patients and parents are following your treatment of the standard therapy, but they're still not responding. That may raise a suspicion of refractory constipation. Constipation, which begins early infancy along with abnormal distension, raises suspicion of congenital abnormality like Hirschsprung's disease, and that would definitely be a refractory constipation. Children with constipation, if they have poor growth or neurological symptoms, there's a reason to suspect uh, organic causes, and that constipation could be refractory to our standard management approach. What are the possible organic causes of leading to refractory constipation? The one obvious one is Hirschsprung's disease, which presents early in infancy in most cases, but we have seen short segment Hirschsprung disease presenting later in life, almost in uh, one, or one year or two years of age. And that would present as refractory constipation and one should keep the, this diagnosis in mind. Celiac disease, most of the times presents with diarrhea, but can present as constipation. And this is something to keep in mind. Cystic fibrosis is a disease of Western world. Uh, and we do see here in the United States on and off times. Hypothyroidism can lead to constipation. Spina bifida is a, really a rare problem, but should be suspected when the child has chronic refractory constipation along with subtle neurological symptoms. In one study done in Boston children, this was found in 9% of refractory constipation. So it's very, very rare, but something that should be kept in mind. And finally, children coming with pseudo obstruction. Uh, this is a really a very difficult problem. It, uh, these children come with intractable constipation with abdominal distension and they really completely fail the standard management approach. So how do we work this uh, kids up? Obviously, according to clinical feature, the uh, workup should be planned. Uh, most of this should be done by pediatric gastroenterologists because these cases are rare and they do need special expertise of uh, knowledge and skills to address this. Some are simple, celiac serology can indicate celiac disease, which can be confirmed by endoscopic evaluation. And thyroid tests can point to thyroid dysfunction. Uh, we do sweat tests for cystic fibrosis here. Uh, spine imaging, uh, so as I mentioned, it's a very rare problem, uh, but if we do suspect constipation with lower, uh, lower limb symptoms and weakness, I think spine imaging in the form of MRI should be considered. 
Contrast enema to assess anatomy is useful for both Hirschsprung disease and also to look for any anatomical problem in the colon. Rectal biopsy is diagnostic for Hirschsprung disease. And inorectal and colonic manometry is important to assess colonic motility, particularly when we are suspecting uh, cases like pseudo obstruction. The last one is really uh, reserved for centers which have specific expertise in doing this colonic manometry studies. So here are some uh, uh, examples of Hirschsprung disease. This is a contrast enema which shows small rectum and recto sigmoid ratio, which is less than one. So normally rectum should be wider than sigmoid, but that's not the case here. And also we do see a clear transitional zone here, which, uh, which is of dilated normal colon. So this is strongly suggestive of uh, Hirschsprung's disease. Endorectal manometry is also another tool to diagnose uh, Hirschsprung's disease. In this uh, procedure, we keep the rectal balloon and along with there is a catheter which has a sensors for the pressure uh, to measure external anal sphincter pressure. So on the right side on the top is a normal rectosphincteric reflex tracing. So when the rectal balloon is inflated to a varying sizes, 10 ml, 5 ml, et cetera, usually there should be uh, external anal sphincter relaxation. And this is shown by the curve uh, by drop in pressure there. So upper tracing is normal and the lower tracing shows that even if the balloon is inflated, there's no anal sphincter relaxation and that absent rectosphincteric reflex is very suggestive of Hirschsprung's disease. The final diagnosis is made with rectal suction biopsy, which can be done by submucosa or by full thickness biopsy by surgery. We are looking for ganglion cells. And in the absence of ganglion cell, there are often hypertrophied nerves, which can be stained by acylcholine uh, stain, which is shown here. As I mentioned, when we do come across children with intractable constipation, due to colonic neuropathy, pseudo-obstruction is suspected. This is a normal colonic motility study. And when this is uh, not seen, it is because dysmotile colon. So what are the therapeutic options we have? Obviously we treat underlying conditions such as hypothyroid and celiac. There are medications, sacral nerve stimulation, psychostomy, plus antigrade enema and surgical interventions. So polythene glycol should be the first choice, but definitely if that is not available or accepted, lactulose or even milk of magnesia can be tried. Sometimes combination of regular osmotics with intermittent stimulants can be helpful. Prokinetics, lubiprostone has some role, but prucalopride has failed to show any superiority over placebo. So lubiprostone is a chloride channel activator and increases fluid secretion. And it does improve the bowel movement frequency and consistency. And good thing is it is very well tolerated and does not have any side effects. And we have used that in some cases of refractory constipation. Sacral nerve stimulation is an experimental therapy uh, to stimulate sacral nerve with some good experience in adults with urinary and fecal incontinence. And small pediatric studies have shown improvement, but it's truly reserved for very refractory cases. Sicostomy and antigrade enema is a novel therapy and works extremely well in well-selected children, particularly children with spina bifida and imperforate anus who have incontinence. For them, we do the sicostomy placement, which can be done laparoscopically or endoscopically, and daily antigrade enema is given to clean the whole colon, which usually happens within an hour. And it allows continence for these children with a success rate of 65 to 89%. And this can be a really game changer for their life. For Hirschsprung disease, the, obviously there should be a excision of aganglionic segment and pull-through operation is needed. 
For severe dysmotile colon or pseudo obstruction, these are extremely challenging cases where colon just does not move and they, they need disimpaction every few days and they do get, uh, get uh, frequent hospitalizations. In these cases, very aggressive surgical interventions such as segmental colectomy or colostomy may be needed depending on the colonic motility studies. And in rare patients, we do have patients who had to have colectomy with ileostomy. So in summary, childhood constipation needs a systematic management approach that is uh, endorsed by the uh, Indian Society of Pediatric Gastroenterology. Non-adherence to treatment can cause refractory constipation. And in these cases, it's usually easy going back to the treatment plan and correcting the deficiencies. Refractory constipation per se is quite rare, but would need pediatric gastroenterology workup and aggressive interventions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Dinesh, for this excellent presentation. Thank you. Mm -hmm.